them the alternative media call, well, others call it too, but they, we tend to hear it a lot, the Hegelian dialectic. And they say, okay, this is how we are being manipulated. We're being manipulated with uh, a solution that's presented to us, a solution that is decided for us, then a problem is created and a reaction is controlled and we get to the solution. Now, as I've read about that, I... I understand to some extent the um, the problem reaction solution but in my reading about Hegel I think that the evil side of this has been blamed on Hegel when really this is not what what Hegel was trying to get to and and I'm understanding and I'll, I'll turn it over to you uh, Matthew when I've when I've kind of cleared my head here, uh, I'm understanding that Hegel saw the problem reaction solution as a diagnostic view of the world and how things operate, whereas the elite tend to use it against us in a way to manipulate us. Am I right or am I wrong? Okay. Uh, if you have six or seven hours, I could I could answer that. Um, well, I, I don't even. I don't even know where to start. Um, it, when I was in graduate school, I spent a huge amount of time on George William Frederick Hegel and his epistemology. Um, Hegel, as you probably know, is the most, by far, the most difficult writer to read. Most people, including professional philosophers, simply have given up because they have no idea what he's talking about, partially because he has his own vocabulary, Partially because his method of argumentation was extremely difficult to follow, and on top of it all, he was very long-winded. Now, I did my I did my master's thesis on Hegel's Philosophy of Right, which was his last book, strictly on political theory. But then I did my dissertation on Michael Oakeshott. Michael Oakeshott was an English idealist who was a follower of Hegel uh, to some extent, and, and died in 1991. So. I have some uh, understanding of how to approach this, but I want to stress that you just don't go into a library and take Hegel's two-volume logic or his phenomenology of spirit and start reading it. You know, you'll just end up burning it because you won't have any clue what's what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and and I know that there are people who are kind of on our side politically who mention the Hegelian dialectic without, first of all, having a clue of who Hegel was, and number two, not having a clue what dialectics are. Uh, so that's, but, but you're the first guy who's in, in, in um, mentioning Hegel at all in a political context has begun to realize that what's happened to Hegel's general epistemological method has absolutely nothing to do with what Hegel uh, supported. Politically speaking, he was extremely conservative, and and I'm I'm going to tell you, uh, the philosophy of right, if you can get through it, is one of the best, most brilliant works of political philosophy that I've ever come across. And and back in the ninety early nineties, I really became very much a uh, a a Hegelian. So that that's that's the really brief answer. That yes, you're correct, but I I want to go further than that. Um, do. The, the the thesis antithesis distinction is not something that Hegel talks about very much. The concept of the creation of a synthesis this isn't something that Hegel talks about very much. I I want to because I've read both volumes of the Logic, uh, his Encyclopedia, as well as Phenomenology of Spirit and the uh, the Philosophy of Right. Even the Phenomenology of Spirit, I spent in 1996. I spent all of, of February of that year on the first 40 pages of that 800 page book. But that's really the only way to read it because even, and even there, it, there's more questions that come up than, than it answers. But that's just his style. Now, um, let me reduce this and I'm going to give you the most simple and simplistic version of this I could possibly muster. And in so doing, I'm going to give you two propositions concerning as to what the dialectical method is in Hegel, not in Hess, not in Marx, not in Feuerbach, in Hegel. Number one, there is no such thing as our direct perception of any object in space and time. There is no direct perception between your senses and this object, whatever you happen to be looking at at the moment. That does not exist. Uh, everything that you do, 
Everything that you look at and you hear or you sense in one way or another is being filtered by a whole set of historically conditioned concepts. That when you look at something, you're looking at it with many different lenses between you and the object. And these lenses have to do with the political situation and economic situation that you happen to live under in this particular point in history. That's number one. There is no such thing as objects floating around in space and time. We filter them. Objects change us as much as we comprehend objects. The second proposition is that there is no such thing in how we look at the world around us. There is no such thing as an individual. Uh, an individual is, in, Hege in Hegel's term, is abstract. The word ha abstract, like everything in Hegel, doesn't mean what we normally mean. Abstract means, nothing means what it normally means. That's the problem with trying to read this guy. Um, the word abstract means uh, not a real individual. A real individual is that which is cognized only through itself, by itself. The only thing that could uh, satisfy that criterion is the whole, the absolute. What we're looking at, when we look at an individual, we are, not only are we looking at this filtered through our concepts that we're born and raised with, but we're looking at it in a myriad of relations with, with everything surrounding it. Um, when you look at an object in nature and you call a tree an individual, it is an abstract statement. In other words, it's only partially true because a tree or a rock or a human being is something that has, has been created by so many different other objects coming together in a context, in a set of relationships, and an individual is only, only one little piece of that. So those two propositions, that's the radically fourth grade level understanding of, of what Hegel is talking about in his two-volume logic. Wow. Okay, so now let me let me uh, hop around a little bit, and and um, given our limited time, we'll stay with uh, trying to understand how this dialectic term, Hegelian dialectic, is is applied to us indirectly, and and what's happened. So, I'm reading that Hegel was a conservative. Hegel was not Jewish, was he? No, absolutely not. I think he was hostile to Jews in general. Okay, so what what was the what was it that Marx saw, and did, did, was Marx able to accurately decode Hegel? How was it that, that Marx adapted um, what Hegel is saying here? Well, th there's more than one step. Um, if Hegel and Marx ever met each other, Hegel would condemn Karl Marx with no hesitation. Now, isn't that interesting? Karl that's, not Marx, you, that's not what you hear. This is, that's Okay, go ahead. Well, again, I mean, there's like ten people in the world who, had, who have ever been able to get through the phenomenology and kind of get what's going on. I'm not one of them. Um, but I think I have a halfway decent grasp on what's, on what's happening. Hegel um, believed in the primacy of thought and logic. Spirit came first. For Karl Marx, there was no spirit. At Karl Marx for the most part, received his philosophical point of view from Ludwig Feuerbach, who wrote a book called The Essence of Christianity, where he held that our spiritual concepts are the result of our alienation. Um, uh, given, given the perverted nature of the world that we live in, we have projected our needs and desires for wholeness and fulfillment and created this whole spiritual realm of God and angels and saints and the church and everything else. That's where Marx, that's where Marx takes his start. Hegel was simply used by Marx and, and the, the method of the dialectic that Marx took was something that was, made, and Moses Hess, even more than, than Marx, that, uh, social classes and political movements, the relation between the individual and society, the state and the world, all this kind of thing um, can be understood through this constant clash of opposites. And in any given moment, these opposites existed in some kind of equilibrium. For Marx, technology uh, and, and the development of science is what's going to tip this equilibrium into a revolutionary situation, both in terms of the development of capitalism from feudalism, 
and eventually the development of socialism from from capitalism. So I want to say that between Hegel and Marx, you have absolutely not very little in common. You don't even have the method in common. And ultimately, Hegel's Hegel's um, Hegel's final thought is: you have to understand the whole of natural philosophy before you can understand any piece of it. And that's what makes him so difficult. So I'm I'm reading from uh, your two uh, your two uh, precepts, I guess you called them more uh, earlier on. Um, Hegel was saying no such thing as a as a pure individual. Uh, the real individual is is abstract. Ultimately, Hegel is saying God is the only real individual. Is he not? Sort of. Um, but by abstract, what Hegel means is something that's only partially true. So, for example, if I claim that I am an individual and I am therefore independent of anything that's happening around me, Hegel will say, well, that's, that's true only in a very limited way, because your whole vocabulary concerning rights and the family and the tradition that you're raised in and the society, all the economic issues and everything else, that helped create that very same person, that same ego that you're saying is completely independent. So you automatically have a contradiction. You can't go around claiming that I am a sovereign individual when in fact that very concept of the sovereign individual predates you and is something that has philosophically been formulated and that's the context in which you were born and raised. Had you been born a thousand years ago, you wouldn't even have been talking in, in those terms. Mm -hmm. So the very action of you claiming that you are a sovereign individual contains in and of itself a contradiction. So do you understand what I'm trying to say here? So I, it's, it's, it's abstract in the sense that it's only partially true. Yes. It yes. would be completely true if you were to then embed yourself in these institutions and the different points of view that have developed in Western society over the last few hundred years, and then you realize that you're a product of uh, those intellectual movements. Uh, so that's that's what he means. That would be a, that would be coming closer to the truth mm. than the simple statement that you are this sovereign individual. That doesn't just occur for for people. That occurs for anything that we may look at in nature, any any natural object is the same way. A tree can't exist without oxygen, it can't exist without carbon dioxide, it can't exist without uh, the soil, it can't exist without water. So to talk about a tree completely separate from all of these other things is to be crazy. Yeah. A tree yeah. is only a part of a much broader context. So if you were to point to a tree and say that's a thing, that's an object, Hegel says that that in and of itself contains the very act of you saying that contains an inherent contradiction. I think the little light is turning on, uh, Matthew. I think I'm beginning to understand what you're saying. And, and forgive me, it's um, um, 6 in the morning and the wheels are, are, are uh, slowly starting to roll. I'm going to uh, redirect this just a little bit because we'll come back to who Hegel was and so on. I'd, I would like, though, to ask, uh, I have read, and uh, only on the Internet and not in hard copy at this moment, that... Um, uh, Moses Hess, who you mentioned, who's always been a, a character of interest to me, more so probably than Marx, uh, that Moses Hess was influenced by Hegel. Uh, it, would you agree with that, or do you think I'm, is it a, a long bow? Uh, no, I would say the same thing that I said about Marx. I'll say that they both took a handful of things from you. you got to remember, the middle of the 19th century, you, if you were a philosopher, you knew Hegel very well. He <laughs> was the man. He was by far the most dominant figure, philosophically uh, speaking, long after his death. So everybody was influenced by Hegel. So in and of itself, that doesn't mean anything. Hegel was not a materialist. Moses Heston, Karl Marx, and Ludwig Feuerbach, those are the big three in the middle of the 19th century. They are materialists 100%. So mm -hmm. you know, their use of Hegel really just is in the use of what became this stylized and formulaic thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and, and that, you know, it that's a perversion of, of Hegel. Okay. Now, getting on to that, while it's a perversion of Hegel, uh, I'm, I'd like to read to you a quote that I've used, and um, 
uh, as I've used this quote, I understand uh, what the writer is saying, and then as I um, as I read, this is Nikki Rapana, and as I read her work, I thought I better find out before I sound like a before I sound either like an idiot or or like somebody in the alternative movement with a bullhorn shouting at a building. I better be sure that my that I understand, and that's where I began to, to realize that Hegel had been misrepresented. What little I could read about him, but uh, Nikki Rapana writes about. Uh, about uh, the use of the uh, uh, thesis antithesis synthesis, uh, and she uses, and here's a very interesting quote, let me read it to you. The logic of dialectical philosophy has remained above the reach of the common man since the beginning of recorded human history. There are two levels of, two levels of dialectical reasoning. The elite top students, teachers, and practitioners completely understand the final synthesis of dialectical ideologies. Lower level philosophical education does not include the synthesis. This omission is the defining line between freedom and slavery. Modern public education, which excludes the synthesis, furthers the separation of citizens into classes. That's a, a mouthful, but to me, it's a it's a very telling and very powerful analysis of how people are led. Um, have you heard that statement before, or did I email it to you earlier on? Uh, you may have. Uh, I've heard various versions of that thesis for the last you know twenty years uh, of, of that of that type of statement over the last two decades. So no, it, it's not all that uncommon. Um, although I would say that 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 in making that statement. Um, the person never read Hegel, uh, but she may be absolutely, it is a she, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, she may be absolutely correct insofar as other people who came, who came after him. She is correct to say that dialectics has been in existence since the dawn of humanity because Socrates made it, made it, made it clear that, uh, what he did was, uh, use the dialectical form. That simply means that I can only convince my students that I'm telling the truth if my point of view and my opponent's point of view clash and we could come to some kind of common ground over time uh, and I could use that negative um, that, that negative argumentation in, 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 in fact, uh, 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 constructing my own argument. So that's that's what what Socrates was doing. Hegel most certainly uh, didn't believe in any kind of of elitist uh, elitist mentality. Uh, he didn't believe in any of that uh, at all. In fact, um, uh, when you read the philosophy of right, he was very much a, a nationalist and a syndicalist because he was very much afraid that the free market was going to get out of control, that the free market would produce such inequality and poverty that he posited what he calls the corporation. The corporation is something that a lot of nationalists have taken uh, uh, as economically important without realizing its source. A corporation is essentially a craft guild or union that uh, would take workers in a specific area and uh, organize them and then when he posited, he believed in a two, two, um, two chamber uh, legislature that these guilds, so to speak, uh, would be represented in the upper house. So, um, he, uh, so I, I think that Hegel was very, very concerned with what unrestrained capitalism can produce in terms of inequality and posited the corporation as something that would help justify and form a truly moral and organic state. Uh, and even there, when Hegel uses the word state, he doesn't use it in the same way that me and you normally use it. He has a totally different thing. It's actually somewhat of a, of a common early 19th century German concept of state. State for Hegel didn't just mean the army and bureaucracy. It meant all of the ethnic and linguistic and cultural traditions of a people that come to justify any law that happens to be passed by the legislature. In other words, it's legitimate only if we as citizens can see ourselves in its promulgation. So Hegel's politics is, uh, I think, immensely profound. 
And now the philosophy of right is easier to read than the phenomenology, but unless you know his vocabulary, don't even try. Amazing. And Hegel himself was um, uh, was not attempting to obscure what he was saying. He's not like a Talmudist just trying to uh, to hide his uh, his opinion behind nuance only for the uh, only for the elect. He has had to form a vocabulary to uh, to relay his concepts. Am I correct there? I would I would say that I I think that like a lot of people he was afraid that a lot of what he was saying would be vulgarized and he certainly was right about that. This is why Christ didn't write anything down. This is why Socrates didn't write anything down. They were afraid that the transmission would be distorted if you write something down and, and on paper uh, it can be twisted in any number of ways. And I think I think maybe I think his style was just very very obscure. Largely because he's synthesizing a whole lot of very difficult people. He's he's synthesizing Plato and Aristotle. He's synthesizing Kant and Fichte, uh, and all of those guys in and of themselves are fairly difficult. Trying to bring them all together in one large synthetic system, I think, was very very hard. And that's why when people do Hegel, they 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 study Hegel. It's like you know you got to go and live in a cave for five years and and just and just concentrate. Because you you really have to um, you have to absorb so much at the same time and keep it all straight and that's a heck of a lot of work. If I was going to live in a cave for five years to absorb something, it would be the Bible. I would have to think that Hegel would be somewhere down the list, at least in myself. But no, no, um, I agree. I agree. I'm simply saying that, uh, and this really is is kind of a sustained critique of a lot of people, the talking heads, people who are writing out there on our side. Who you know they they drop these names like Plato and Hegel and they don't have a clue as to what they're talking about. They heard a rumor somewhere and this is what they're repeating. I'm saying that if you want to if you want to understand these people, it's a oh, full time yes. job. And, and, and I agree, and and uh, and that's why I so much appreciate your input in in this and trying to. Uh, trying to uh, help me as a as a rank amateur with an analytical mind to to get to the core of that. Now, nevertheless, the problem reaction um, solution or the pre plan pre planned solution and the problem reaction that has been used against free people, has it not? Uh, well, I'm, not, in the I'm sense not saying he I'm not saying Hegel's view, but let's let's now st step a little bit back from Hegel and and say this concept of I have a solution. Maybe I'll give you an example here. Um, uh, my solution is that I want to break Iraq into three, give Israel control over the north, and convert the oil contracts to PSAs to profit sharing agreements. This is Iraq. This is what our solution is. We don't tell anybody. We don't tell the slave class. So the problem is Saddam is bad. Saddam killed babies in incubators. Saddam has weapons of mass destruction. Saddam doesn't cut his nose hair. You know, whatever. Right. And the reaction is uh, Operation Desert Storm, Operation Desert Shield, Operation Iraqi Freedom. So we see the pro uh, um, we're presented with a problem. We have a reaction. All we do is those 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 Iraqis are bad, and the solution is what we have today. Iraq is breaking into three. Israel has control over the north. The oil contracts are being converted to PSAs. That process has been used to the detriment of humanity. You're absolutely correct, and, and I'll, I'll give a, a far simpler example, and that's the, two, the, the, the two-party system. No yes. matter who you elect, you're getting the same ideology seen from two points of view. The, the, end, the, the ends of these people are precisely the same. The means that the two parties, you liberals and conservatives, would use to get to the uh, to the ends are different, but the ends are exactly the same. So it doesn't make any difference who, who you elect. Now, I don't think politicians have very much power. I think bureaucrats and judges and, and bankers have power. But that's just an example. Now, I want to say that when you talk about the perversion of the dialectic, the way that you have just described it, you're referring to uh, an old occult doctrine that good and evil are the same thing, darkness and light are the same thing, truth and falsehood are the same thing, and we can't judge between them. Uh, that's, you know, you see it in the yin yang symbol, you see it in, in the two pillars of, uh, Yo -Yo Kim and Boaz of, of the temple. You see it in all of these dualistic occult doctrines. Um, that good and evil are just words, they're just labels. Um, we're really talking about the same reality seen from two different points of view. That's not 
what Hegel's saying. Hegel is simply saying that when we look at our external world, we can't take one part of it and isolate it from everything else. Let me give you another example. The guy that I did my doctoral dissertation on, Michael Oksha, his doctoral dissertation done in the 1930s was called uh, Experience and Its Modes. The point was that whenever an individual looks at the external world, they are using the concepts to interpret that world that they have been raised in. So, for example, if I'm a scientist and I've been trained at the university level and I look at um, uh, the natural world outside of me, such a person will see everything as quantity. They'll see everything as biological or chemical relations. And that's fair enough. Uh, when a poet or a religious person looks at the exact same thing, he is not going to see the biological or chemical realities. They'll see symbols. They'll see God's presence. They'll see this integrated whole. When a businessman looks at the exact same thing, the businessman will see, oh, I should chop these trees down and make money out of it. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Everybody looking at the exact same object, given the set of concepts that they've been raised in and trained in, is going to see different things. The final problem is, the real sin here, is when one group, let's say science, claims that its point of view is the only point of view. Mm. Or the businessman saying only dollars and cents, pure quantity, that's the only thing that matters, that is the nature of reality. So what people like Oakshot and to some extent Hegel are saying is that when you when you um when you look at at, at an object, you're not really looking at an object. You're you are looking at a set of concepts that you're using to interpret that object. That's at the core of what we're talking about here. So, ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is uh, uh, is uh, Father um, Matthew Matthew Raphael Johnson. We're discussing uh, the dialectic, the Hegelian dialectic, and uh, we're and how we view the world. And we have the we have just really got to the crux of the matter. Now, I'm going to try to step back, um, uh, Matthew, and if I've missed this or got it wrong, you can correct me. What we have now in the world in which we live is that our, uh, and, and, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, all our views about any particular thing we see, I'm looking out at my lemon tree. So the uh, the evolutionist view of the lemon tree is the one that everybody has. This came from, I don't know, a mushroom or whatever they want it to be. <clears throat> and uh, And I'm only allowed one view of this. When I look at money, I'm only really allowed one view. So in time, our perception has been unified by uh, by an elite view that probably is money first, um, uh, religion, philosophy second, and maybe uh, well, maybe in that order. I'm not sure. So the this um, I'm going to hand it back to you. Have I got that right, Matthew, or, or am I missing it? No, I, I think you're grasping it. Uh, in other words, what Hegel is is saying, and to uh, even the British idealists like T.H. Uh, Green or Bernard Belson Cat, Michael Oakeshott, what these guys are saying is that um, a, a power elite can substitute their set of concepts and impose that on everybody through the education, media systems, and everything else. And you mentioned evolution, the complete domination of, of science in that particular point of view is uh, that set of concepts that most of us are supposed to use in looking at the outside world, including our own our own personhood. Yes. Uh, well, and, and that's that's what Michael Oakeshott is he's saying that this is the sin of the modern world is that um, is that one particular mode of experience is thrusting itself on everybody else as the only mode of experience and we know that it isn't the only mode of experience so really if i'm applying hegel correctly as opposed to how so many alternative and and armchair philosophers apply him if i'm applying hegel correctly i i absolutely do not see an apple the same way as the next guy sees an apple or i do not see uh money as the next i i i am really compelled to see it differently 
Uh, yeah, and, and that depends on which particular point in history you happen to live in. Uh -huh. That's true. Um, yes. So if we were born a thousand years ago, we wouldn't look at the natural world in, in the same way. Hegel was vehemently, violently opposed to the Illuminati, and he mentions them uh, in his attack on the French Revolution. He condemns the French Revolution and the concept of revolutionary politics because he sees in the French Revolution, he sees a little bit of truth, but a mountain of error. Mm. And that mountain of error is reducible to the concept that the individual, or in that case, the elite individual, was setting himself up as the supreme ruler of everything political and religious and poetic and literary and everything else. That was the problem. That's not how society is. Um, when the individual tries to throw off history, remember, I mean, the, the, the French revolutionaries rewrote the calendar. They started at year one. You know, yes. when you throw out history and tradition and all of these things that help make us what we are, you it automatically will eventually lead to the terror. All revolutions, all revolutions will be bloody because one class of people is setting themselves up as the arbiter of all experience. Everything is political. Everything is dominated by us. This is what he condemns when he writes in the philosophy of right, as well as in other places, uh, in the French Revolution. So that, that should tell you a lot about how he viewed uh, politics in the state and, and revolutionary um, uh, uh, governments. And this is why Karl Marx, while taking the dialectic and using it, condemned uh, uh, Hegel. He wrote a book condemning George William Frederick Hegel. Uh, and, and, uh, and this is some of the reason. Because Hegel, in, in Marx's mind, was this fuddy-duddy monarchist and Prussian bureaucrat, as he called him, and, uh, and, and we can't take him seriously. So uh, that's, that, that, that's the key here. Now, did um, if, you, if I come back to a problem, reaction, solution, or as it's, as it's forced upon us, it's a hidden solution, a problem and reaction, and I'm, I might be changing direction ever so slightly, do you see that as being a, a Talmudic in origin? Do you see the, the uh, influence or the use of that against people as being uh, like, the, like the, uh, the conversations that the rabbis have in the Talmud? Uh, you're absolutely correct, absolutely positively. The Talmud is the most evil set of books I think that have ever been written, and uh, I don't. I, that's that's the mentality that that me and you have dedicated our lives to to condemning. Um, that has nothing to do with with the Hegelian point of view. So really, uh, what, what um, uh, for want of a better phrase, all all of the um, the the the, uh, uh, the alternative media types should really be saying is rather than this is the Hegelian dialectic, it's the Talmudic dialectic that we're really talking about. Right. I, I would use that phrase. I would use Talmudic. I would use occult. I would use whatever it is. But to drag Hegel of all people uh, into this is is really just a tremendous amount of ignorance, uh, especially because the the left uh, after Hegel, you know, Hegel dies in eighteen thirty one. You know, it's you know he's 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 a fairly early figure in in the contemporary era. Uh, you know, the left really condemned Hegel uh, because his philosophy of right is a almost a manifesto of uh, sort of a, a traditionalist uh, Prussian nationalism. And uh, it, it only very rarely gets read like that anymore. I, I think the philosophy of right is, is one of the greatest works of political theory ever put together. Interesting. Well, well, this this is the common tactic of the left uh, to, uh, and probably a little bit of the right too now, as it's become more left. But that is to uh, to scapegoat uh, a thinker or scapegoat a concept. Uh, in in the general case, Christians today are scapegoated for pretty much all of the evils in the world. And so I could see that that maybe accidentally Hegel has been scapegoated, or maybe intentionally. Maybe maybe look, we're using a, 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 a Talmudic approach to control the world, but we're going to blame it on this German Christian. Philosopher, uh, you're right. Uh, you're absolutely right. And and although I could understand how they could mistake the dialectic the way that people like Marx uh, understood it for something that Hegel said, because I see the occult, um, uh, black is white, white is black, uh, 
uh, equivalence of light and darkness. I see it everywhere. And with people like Michael Hoffman, who first taught me through his writings about the, this, the central concept um, of, of the occult, that uh, God and the devil really are brothers uh, who just look at the world in two very different ways. Yeah. Um, when I first watched Harry Potter, I the first thing that struck me was that Harry Potter and Voldemort are the same person. That's the, that's the secret understanding of that set of movies. Light is dark and dark is light. They're the same person. Uh, and, and I'm seeing that. I'm seeing it all over the place. But I, I don't want to. I don't want to say. I, I don't want to um, uh, make any of that uh, contingent on at least uh, what Hegel thought he was doing. No, and that's that's excellent. But now, now, so let's let's drift away now to this uh, occult view of the world. Uh, several years ago, I posted. Uh, I wrote an, an interesting. I thought it was an interesting article, and it it was about um, uh, David's sin. And that's King David's sin. Now, we we would uh, understand it pretty much. I would, anyways, you, uh, at face value. So here is a here is a king who's uh, who's a, a basically a good man, but his sense of judgment under pressure is not good. He sees a beautiful woman. He has an affair. Uh, he arranges the death of her husband, uh, for which he pays a horrible price. So that's my face value reading. Uh, I mean, that's a lifetime of a, of a king in two sentences. Okay, but the Talmudic view of this is that since David was righteous, he could do no wrong. Therefore, David's, um, therefore King David actually didn't sin um, uh, by having the affair with Bathsheba because when a man is at war, her, he's considered divorced, so her, his wife is fair game. He really sinned in how he communicated this to the populace. Have you read that? I've absolutely read that. And again, thank you to Michael Hoffman, who in his Judaism Discovered, uh, uncovers all of this complete and total nullification of the Old Testament. And the theory is, as it developed in the Talmud, that the Jewish male cannot sin. And this is why in the Talmud, and I've actually had to send uh, the snippets of this to, to people who didn't believe me, that the prophets, especially the prophet Isaiah, are also, along with Jesus, in hell. Because the whole world of the prophets was to condemn Israel for its lack of faith, for its fraud, for its lying, for its being like all the nations. Every th single prophet, without exception, had the same mentality. Therefore, these cannot be taken as legitimate writers of, of Scripture. And therefore, Isaiah, uh, leading the way, because Isaiah was just so, he wrote so much, uh, was is, is in hell, as are all the prophets, because they condemned Israel, and Israel is not condemnable in the Talmudic mm. mentality. When, when God is dialoguing with Jeremiah, and Jeremiah, and I think it's 31, mm. and, and Jeremiah said, what about the city? And God said, the place, the city has vexed me from the day they built it. And uh, speaking of Jerusalem, well now, uh, I when I read this and I say this at face value, uh, I don't need to re I don't need to codify this. I don't need to reinterpret this passage to say the city's always given God trouble. A Talmudist, on the other hand, must do something with either the statement or with the messenger. Correct? Absolutely, it has to be nullified. Yeah. How could you possibly read someone like Amos? who does nothing but condemn the Israelite women at the time with their money and their arrogance and their pushiness, he sounds like us. <laughs> he, he's saying the same kind of things just, you know, thousands of years ago. So either these men have to be condemned to hell, which is normally how they do it, or the whole thing has to be rewritten and nullified. And no matter how often I cite this stuff to these Protestant Zionists, I get I get nowhere because they don't care they don't want to know and it's just too inconvenient. Now one of our broadcasters on the network here is a gentleman named Don Preston who's a, a, a prolific author and scholar written many books and um, he uh, uh, he attempted to engage a rabbinical student to debate 
uh, particularly based on uh, Jeremiah 3, where it talks about the fact that the um, that the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark, there'll be no remembrance of it. It'll be gone forever. And I can't exactly quote it, Jeremiah 3.16, I think it is, that the Ark will be gone, it won't be in memory, etc. anymore. And I've attempted to do this myself. So when they talk about we're going to rebuild the temple, for example, I say, all right, how do you deal with that? Now, he was, uh, they refused to debate him on that. I thought, having heard that, I'm going to try a different approach. So I used an internet forum with a, with a, um, a rabbi who I, who was very good. We had a very good back and forth uh, conversation. I understand what he was saying. When I got to this point and I said, well, tell me what that means, he immediately knew or sensed that I wasn't Jewish. <laughs> and not that I was obscuring it, but because I could, speak the language, if you will. I could un- I understand what they were doing. And he said, you won't understand. And I said, why won't I understand? The passage directly says, there will never be a return to the Ark of the Covenant in Jeremiah. Why, did you, why do you think he said I wouldn't understand? Is it that it was hidden from me or that I was attempting a direct interpretation of the passage? Uh, I think what he meant, I mean, when, when, when a, uh, a real Orthodox rabbi in, in a Talmudic sense uh, talks with us, First of all, they're not talking to a human being. They're talking to a a soulless animal. So what is the point of going to my cat and explaining deep theology to my cat? (laughs) I'm sorry, I didn't think about it in those terms. Go ahead. You know, I've never tried to do this, but that's more or less what the hardcore Talmudic point of view would be. So um, the point is, and and I, I say this to anyone who will listen, these guys don't give a damn about what we call the Old Testament. They wouldn't care about the Old Testament. It's completely irrelevant. The people who matter are the old rabbinical sages who put the Talmud together. This is the authority. And um, uh, the, the citations that people like Hoffman and myself can put together and, and, and uh, on this question could fill this room. It's, mm. it's, uh, the Old Testament is totally, not only do they not believe it, it's completely irrelevant. Uh, Judaism is a is a political, uh, ethnic, and racial movement uh, for absolute domination uh, over places like the United States. It has nothing to do with theology whatsoever. Uh, there's no spirit. There's no God except for the Jews collectively. So the Old Testament and, and, and this and this uh, and this you know, the prophets and the Psalms and Proverbs and everything is completely. Irrelevant. It's just not part of the equation. But for him to explain that to you and try to make it sound coherent, forget it. I, I would probably, if I were him, I'd probably say the same thing. Oh, you wouldn't get it. I, I have other things to do. So that's, yeah, that's the main yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, well, when I first started this program, the first time, first story I told a friend who's a businessman who was on an airplane sitting next to a rabbinical student, just as it as it happened, uh, a young uh, and so my my friend is very well spoken and engaged the gentleman in, in quite a, a good conversation about uh, whatever. And finally, he said, "So you you I'm a Christian." Said you you wouldn't believe in Jesus, of course. No, you know the typical uh, smile, nod, no, not another Gentile kind of no, I guess. Right, right. <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, and, and my friend said, um, how do you, um, how do you understand, uh, uh, Daniel's prophecies pointing to the time when he would be born and, and so on? And the rabbinical student said, oh, excuse me, I need to talk to my friend. Got up, left, found another seat, never came back. Yeah. Just and wouldn't it's not, engage him at all. Right. And it's not that he doesn't have an answer. It's just that to answer you would be going against the Talmud. They, they can't reveal a lot of this stuff to a, a non-Jewish, uh, and especially a, an explicitly Christian audience. And, you know, I, I grew up in a Jewish area. I uh, am from Union County, New Jersey. And uh, I, I, know, I, I know the mentality. All, a lot of my friends growing up were, were, uh, were Jews. And this, this is the basic mentality. This isn't prejudice. This is something that I know very, very well. And I reacted to the Jewish mentality only because I know it very well. Well, in, in my own uh, place here, I, I have, in, in many respects, a, a a a pity for my Jewish friends. I have many Jewish friends and, and businessmen uh, and, and acquaintances and uh, in the business world in a city like this one, because I, like them, have been victims of bad eschatology. And uh, for years when I was a Christian Zionist, 
was thinking, and I, I, I am a very, uh, I'm ashamed to say it, um, uh, Matthew, and Michael always chuckles when he said, Al used to be a Christian Zionist. Well, I was. <laughs> uh, but I used to see the inconsistencies, and I used to say, how can it be that these two worldviews, which are not a little bit different, that is, um, that is uh, the, the Jewish view of the kingdom and the Christian view of the kingdom, how can they have been synthesized, again, back to our, uh, to our synthesis question, how could they have been synthesized into a new religion and finally I just had to start asking the right questions right and that could be painful because even I when I my first couple of years in college I was very pro-Israel uh, I was Roman Catholic which you know pretty much is just a synagogue for the Gentiles and uh, I I well I mean at least the last few popes I mean that's all they yeah, want to talk about definitely the last uh, few that's right yeah the last few and so you know the point is um, I had to ask those questions, and uh, a lot of my a lot of my uh, uh, Jewish friends at the time, you know, eventually abandoned me. So I can't say I have Jewish friends anymore. Uh, that's that was a long time ago, and and um, uh, the attacks on. I mean, my father was a funeral director uh, uh, who had a funeral home in a in a, a Gentile funeral home in a Jewish area. Uh, let's say that he got he got death threats very early on because to have Gentile corpses. In a Jewish area, uh, is I mean, you know, people had to move out. I mean, you can't have Gentile corpses within a certain area. So, uh, I I know this stuff from from experience, and I know how much they hate us, and I know if um, what they did in the Soviet Union and how they they wildly deny it. Uh, and this is this is the nature of our situation right now. And me and you might disagree on the concept of the end times. But uh, but but as far as the agency of of sin in this world right now, uh, organizationally speaking, I think we're on the same page. Yes, we, yes, we are. And and, and I, we've looked at um, uh, we've looked at some of the, the the history of the Soviet Union. That in fact, when after the fall of it, you have Rabbi Weiss saying this was. I'm going to definitely misquote him here, but something like this was one of the greatest uh, accomplishments of the sons and daughters of Israel. And he wasn't talking about the creation of, uh, of, of the state of Israel. He was talking about the creation of the Bolshevik state. I could go back to the 1920s and 30s and come up with Jewish newspaper after Jewish newspaper yep. saying that the Soviet Union is ours. Uh, that this is our, these are our people, this is our political system. And, uh, the, the, you know, back then, they didn't make a big deal. I mean, the, the, this was our system. Now, of course, they'll deny it. But, you know, the, the Jews talk to one another in, in one respect. They talk to us in a totally different respect. They're constantly schizophrenic. And uh, I think this is one of the problems that has led to a Jewish mental illness and a lot of Jewish personal problems in the 20th century, at least in the 20th century. Yep. Well, well, when you come to uh, back to our question of of the dialectic and how and how uh, um, conversation is maintained and how culture is maintained, you begin to see this this Talmudic style influence. So what we're saying is we we really want the degradation of the family. Uh, not our families, of course, other families, uh, <laughs> their families, or whatever. Um, so rather than rather than upfront say we want to abolish marriage, they may as well say it now. Uh, rather than upfront say um, uh, we want everybody to experiment with homosexuality, though soon they might even make it compulsory if they'd have their way. Right. What happens is you have this problem reaction that causes everybody to be soft on those issues that have morally destroyed, those moral issues that have managed to destroy every culture that has embraced them in history. We are the first people so well informed, at least we allegedly, who have embraced and adopted the ills that have wiped out every single culture. And I see this problem reaction solution as the way it's been brought upon us. I, I think you're right. The creation of a false opposition the uh, the concept of a socially acceptable rebellion uh, that that's everywhere and and I see it in uh, uh, but but I, I want to say that when you read Hegel's philosophy of right the primary unit of social life that informs everything else is the family yes. both the nuclear family and the extended family and now that family will eventually break up as the kids grow up and the parents die. Then they go off and they work in what is called civil society or our day-to-day -day economic uh, labor issues. However, the way Hegel views society, 
the legitimacy of the corporation, as I mentioned before, and the corporations is coming to form the state, is that we are prepared to accept these things as something along the lines of a much larger family. Mm. And and he and, you know they they really come from that same source. It's not just a unity, but it's a unity that we can rationally see and justify as our own because we speak the same language, we have the same interests, we have the same basic ethnic, cultural, and moral concepts, and that's where and only where solidarity comes from. So unless the state partakes somehow of the our initial family when we were kids. It can't have legitimacy. Well, gentlemen, I do thank you once again, Al. We'll see you back here next week. Matthew, we hope to see you again soon.